Well, we've been talking about mercy this week. Um, we talked, we started off Monday by kind of defining mercy. I'm going to read it again here in a moment because it's really a, a very important definition to keep in mind. And then we really kind of dove into the idea of mercy by way of justice. And our example, of course, was the Brian Stevenson book, Just Mercy. And I love that title because, you know, just sort of a double entendre there. It's just in terms of justice. And it's also just in terms of the simplicity of it. You know, the simplicity of extending mercy is really something that we can easily overcomplicate in our mm -hmm. lives. And then yesterday, we talked about appealing to divine mercy, looking for God's mercy to be bestowed upon us, typically in times of trouble, like what we're in right now, or it could be just times of uh, loneliness, uh, self-doubt. And that leads us to what I wanted to focus on here today, is I think so often we look at these other two elements of appealing for divine mercy, for God to extend mercy upon us, and for mercy that we would in turn extend to another. But there's another important component to that, and that is that sometimes we have to step back and understand that we need to be merciful to ourselves. It's part of, it's tied to forgiveness, isn't it? And it's also tied to love. Jesus tells us that of the two great commandments, to love God with all your heart and soul and strength. And the second, like it, that we love our neighbor as ourself. The reason he has to come in later, I think, to say to the disciples on that first Monday, Thursday, that I give you a new commandment that I command you to love one another as I have loved you. Because sometimes we can find ourselves not particularly loving ourselves. We can find ourselves in deep self-conflict. Sometimes people can find themselves in a worse state of self-loathing that's tied to things like depression. It's a very real concern. It's a particular concern at this time because we can take these kind of quiet times and times that we aren't uh, busying ourselves with other things that we would normally do and find ourselves doing a self-examination that may not be particularly healthy. We can find ourselves dwelling on things that we perhaps didn't do that we should, or that we did do that we shouldn't, or the forgiveness that we were supposed to extend to another and that we didn't, or that that appeal to mercy for God's mercy, that we neglected to do that because we may have kind of walked away from God. All of those things can really pile up on us as an individual and it's really important for us to say, you know, I do need to have mercy on myself because God's mercy is already there, but is my mercy for myself there as well? So that's really what we're focused on today. Now let's start with some morning prayer. We'll start on page 80 of the prayer book. I invite you to turn to that. We'll just take a moment of silence. Christ has entered not into a sanctuary made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and, and will, will be forever. forever. Amen. Alleluia. 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 The Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. And we'll adore him in the words of the Pascha Nostrum on page 83 of the prayer book together. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ, Christ our, our Passover has been sacrificed, sacrificed for us. us. Therefore, Therefore, let us keep the feast, feast. Not, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin 
and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man is called also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. There's a lot of beauty in that Pascha Nostrum, which is Latin for Christ our Passover. That's what we really celebrate in these great 50 days of Easter. And I'm thankful that we have 50 days to do it because it's way too much to try to do in one day. This idea that Christ gave himself up for us, it has that deep of a love for us that for him also to show mercy is quite natural. But sometimes it's not as natural for us to show mercy to ourselves. Even with that reality, we're gonna talk about some things I found online about that. But first I thought I would tell you a little story about myself. This one's a little embarrassing, so, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. You see, sometimes when we find ourselves doing something that we shouldn't or not doing something that we should, that we violate those two great laws of loving God with all our heart, loving our neighbor the way that we should, that we can find ourselves kind of wracked with things like guilt and shame. Guilt and shame are very powerful negative tools. They really can be powerful tools, frankly, of the deceptor. Because what it can do is really drag our soul down that we're not even really connected to what's around us because we have that sense of self-loathing and self-punishment and I'm not worthy and so on and so forth. Even as we have Pascha Nostrum, we have Christ our Passover that is unyielding, unchanging, unmoving. And so now my little story. This took place, I'm going to say 10 years old. It was upstate New York. And I was just a little boy along with other little boys that managed to find ways to do stupid things. Well, I did a stupid thing one day and um, it was along with a couple of friends. And we decided that uh, we went down to the local white hen pantry and we found something there that we kind of wanted to have, but we didn't have the money for it. Now, mind you, this is an item that we shouldn't have had in the first place, whether we had the money or not. I'm not going to go into detail about what that is. You can imagine. So we end up taking these items, this item, and I have it in my little pouch and I'm driving my bike back to my house. And lo and behold, I find myself um, sensing there was a car behind me. And I turn around and that car happened to be the local police officer. His name was Officer Perizola. And he stopped me. And of course, I had an entire internal meltdown of guilt over where I was what I was doing and what I had done. And so he stopped me and he said, um, Jeffrey, can I speak to you for a minute? Well, I went into a full throttle confession before he had even said a word. I absolutely came clean. I said, here it is. I did it. I'm sorry. And, um, and so then that it was at that point that he informed me that that's not why he was stopping me. He just wanted to find out something about another person if I had seen them. Well, that of course did not spare me from being in great trouble because my confession, though honorable, was really not terribly honorable. It was just because I was scared. I had done a very wrong thing and it was eating me up so much that I wasn't even really paying attention to what was going on. But you see, we're not meant to live that way. We're not meant to have our soul ache that way. Because this is kind of a funny little story because it was something that was so easily self-resolved. Um, I'm sure that it included some grounding, some other matters as well. Um, although even though I was being grounded and my parents were very stern about it, I think they also got a great laugh out of my folly. But the problem is that sometimes when we don't have mercy on ourselves in our lives, we can carry those kinds of things and much worse things 
for a very, very long time. And that that can not only just be a shaking to our soul, but it can really just be a long, long deterioration. And so when we celebrate this 50 days of Easter and we are committed to 50 days to spread the love, sometimes we have to unwrap some of those things. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we're afraid of? What is it about us that keeps us at a distance from God or at a distance from another? Is there somebody out there that should be forgiven that hasn't? Or have you not been forgiven by one that possibly could? Those kinds of questions. They're not easy questions to ask, and they're even more difficult to answer. But when we do them, it's amazing how cleansing our soul can be after it's done. I think you're going to hear some of that in the words of our psalm today. Today's psalm is Psalm 51, and you can find it on page 656 of the prayer book. Well, I thought I had it marked. These are those little imperfections that are actually very forgivable but I'm going to have a hard time forgiving myself. In this one. <clears throat> we'll say the psalm responsibly, and I'll start with the first verse. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin and I shall be pure. Wash me and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my inequities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked, and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness, O God of my salvation. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice, but you take no delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Be favorable and gracious to Zion, and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with the appointed sacrifices, with burnt offerings and oblations. Then shall they offer young bullocks upon your altar. I love this statement. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. It really points to the fact that so many of our prayers are really not as aimed at changing God as it is to changing us. It's a great prayer. It's a great sense of mercy that God would clean our heart and give us a right spirit. Because left to our own devices, it's very hard for us to do that. That's where we really need God at our side, hand in hand, walking together, so that when we do stumble, we do fall, when we do find ourselves distancing ourselves from God and one another, and sometimes very dangerous and uh, terrible ways, that we are always called back. That's that great mercy that God extends to us, that we're capable of extending to another. But even sometimes when we accept that grace from God and extend it to one another, we have to take that extra step of extending it to ourselves. Because that is what is intended for us in our lives. I found a, a very interesting um, piece on this about extending mercy to the self. 
This is on what's called the DTR blog. And it's entitled, Seven Ways You Need to Have Mercy on Yourself. It's very interesting. And I'm going to read pieces of this. It's kind of long, so I won't read all of it. And then what we'll do at the conclusion of it is we'll read those Beatitudes from Matthew. It's from chapter 5, the first 12 verses. They're very familiar to the ear. But I think you'll find that after we read some of this and we read it again, so often is the case it is with scripture, that it's a living text and it can take on new meaning all of a sudden, even though we've heard it many, many times. And this starts out by saying, I, this morning I was reading the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. I decided to take a closer look at one of the eight Beatitudes because I felt like God wanted to give me some insight on verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The point of the Beatitudes was to give vision to what the kingdom of God looks like here on earth. What does it look like to really love God with all your heart, soul, and strength? I believe that the answer to that question lies in the Beatitudes. There's something to be said about mercy in relation to learning what it is to know and love God. When I thought about the words, for they show, will be shown mercy, the first thing that I felt God say to me was that when you show mercy to others, they might not always show mercy to you in return. That probably goes without saying. But God does, does keep track of when you show mercy because he desires to shower mercy on his beloved. Part of learning to love God with all your heart is learning to recognize and receive the mercy he wants to give. Us. So it goes on to talk more about that, but what I'd like to point out is some of the practical pieces of this that, uh, and I encourage you to take a look at it. Again, it's D, like dog, T-R, blog. Seven ways you need to have mercy on yourself. And here are the seven. Number one, let God into the mix. Sounds easy. Maybe not so much sometimes. She says here, if you've been reading this and can relate to not being good at showing mercy to yourself, I would challenge you to go before God and ask him to bring to your mind the places in your life where you are withholding mercy from yourself. Sounds a bit like that psalm, doesn't it? Create in me a clean heart and a right spirit. Number two, speak to yourself like you would a friend. I know that sometimes I find myself when I do something kind of dumb, which I do regularly, of course. You know, this is the first thing I might say to myself, oh, you idiot. You ever said that to yourself? I mean, it's just a real natural thing to be that hard on yourself. I do it all the time, which calls me back to God. When I do that, I have to pause and say, you know, I'm not being right with myself. And because I'm not being right with God, because I am part of God's good creation. And not only good, but very good. Even when I don't perform as good. Number three, stop comparing. It's the thief of joy. That's a great line. And she said, this is a big one for me. I am very guilty of making negative comparisons between others and myself, but it steals my joy every time. Number four. Treat yourself. This is my funny way, she says, of taking care of yourself. Self-care is really important because you can't be your best self for others. If you're tired, worn down, and feel like crap, that's not a biblical word, by the way, but it is in this blog. Because you haven't taken any time to do the things that refuel you and to make you happy. And not just that light kind of happiness, not the phony kind of happiness, but this sort of that joy that we heard about in our conversations in the Book of Joy from uh, Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. But we do have to take care of ourselves, and not in a superficial way. Like in today's environment, it's great to go out and take good long walks and feel the sunshine and breathe in the clean air. Number five, take a compliment. Number six, Kind self-talk. You is kind. You is smart. You is important. Very bad grammar, but very true. You are important. You are worthy of being kind to. 
not just by others or by God, but by you. Feel your feelings. She says we have to be able to give ourselves space to feel what we are feeling instead of shoving it down or thinking, I shouldn't feel this right now. Because let's face it, the emotions are going to come out in some way or another. We hear that so much, and we talk about that quite a bit, when we talk about grief, when we have losses in our life. And right now, I hear every single day about the many, many losses that are taking place, not just losses in terms of people that maybe succumb to the virus or another disease, but, but the kind of losses where we prepare for something for so long only to find that it's canceled or it's deferred indefinitely or that it's somehow spoiled. Those are heartbreaking losses. We do grieve over those. But instead of the tendency to just kind of shove it under the rug and move on, when we lose someone dear to us or we lose a job or a relationship has failed or is failing, that, that we take the time to grieve that loss, that we own it, and that we be kind to ourselves in the process of owning it. Like so many things that we talk about, it's easier said than done, isn't it? But it's important to do, and it takes time. It takes care. It takes patience. So I'm going to read the Beatitudes, and then we'll go into our prayers. But listen to it, even though you've heard these a million times in church and other venues. You might hear it a little differently this time. Chapter 5 of Matthew, beginning in the first verse, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. How often are we poor in spirit? I was mighty poor in spirit when that police officer followed me home, I can tell you that. But there's other ways too, isn't there? But Jesus said, saying, blessed are those people, not cursed. Blessed are those who mourn. We just talked about that. For they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they will inherit the earth. There's nothing more humbling about than what we're going through now, isn't there? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Just mercy, right? Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And blessed are you, specifically you, when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Isn't it interesting how we can have something like that that we've read and heard so many times? And after we have a little conversation like what we've had here today, that maybe we read ourselves into this much more than we would otherwise. With that, I ask you to help us in lifting up prayers for those who may be suffering in a great many ways during this particular time. It's a very, very stressful and anxious time. But it's a time to be kind to yourself. Give yourself the room, maybe even the vulnerability, to be blessed, to be merciful, not only to others, but to yourself as well. So we'll continue with our prayers on page 97 of the prayer book. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. O God, the King eternal, who, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning. Drive far from us all wrong desires. Incline our hearts to keep your law and keep our, guide our feet into the way of peace. That having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may when night comes rejoice to give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, you stretched out your arms of love on the hardwood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we reaching forth our hands in love may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. I'd like to ask you to lift up your prayers today for Anne. Lift up your prayers for all of those in the front lines of COVID-19. I ask your prayers especially today for the people of Africa. There's a great fear that they are woefully underprepared to deal with the scourge of the virus, that whatever healthcare workers are there or available to be there, help them through the coming weeks and months. Pray for the small business owners and the self-employed, for the people that are employed by others that may have lost their job at this time, may be fearful of their future or even their present. Pray for Grace, Michael, Andre, Elizabeth, Nance, Julie and her family, Jenny and her family. Pray for Mike, who's been furloughed, a person with great talent and love, that his fears and anxieties may be allayed. Pray for Deanna, Helen, Leon, Tommy, Stephanie, Ryan, Anna B, Fred, Ella, Jenna, Heidi, Michelle, Elliot, Holly, Kathy and Dick, Shirley, Marisa and Betty, as they grieve their loss. Susan, Kathy and her family, her son Kwame and granddaughters, Kaya and Khalees. Nels, Claire, Brian, John, Deborah, Pam, Jim, Rob, pray for all of those in particular who have other ailments unrelated to COVID-19 and are finding, finding it very difficult to have those cared for. Pray for James and Mary, Tony, Bill and Sue, Floyd, Bonnie, David, Kate and Jerry, Diane, Donna, Jackson, Patrick, who lost his dear mother here a week ago, and Andrew. I'd like to close today with the same colic that I used yesterday. It's really one of my favorites that we typically have at the conclusion of the herds of the people in the Eucharist. 
It's on page 395 of the prayer book. O Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercy, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And I ask you that in the multitude of your mercies, have a little mercy on yourself perhaps today. And then tomorrow, we're going to feature a related word to mercy that ties into that idea of having mercy on ourselves and having the divine mercy from God and serving others because of one really important word. And I'm not going to tell you until tomorrow at 10. We'll see you then. Mm-hmm. Thank you.